Bar Rhythms. I'm Terrence Affer Anderson. We're back at the Dream City University for the third and final time, bringing you some very special, extraordinary guests. Bar Rhythms is brought to you by the new general and guide and executive publisher, Brenda H. Andrews. I'm so very pleased and delighted to introduce you to a friend of mine, someone that I've known for over 30 years, an extraordinary writer, a playwright, a screenwriter, and a producer, Mr. Clyde Santana. How you doing, buddy? Hey, y'all. Uh, it's good to be here with you. I guess we do have a history, don't we? Well, yeah, we do. That's 30 years worth. 30 years, yeah. That's, so that's a long time. 1984 or 85 when I met you, somewhere back Yeah, there. but we were only like 12 and 13 at the time. Yeah, yeah we stayed young. We know what <laughs> yeah, we yeah. are. We're getting younger. So uh, this is, of course, uh, biorhythms. We, we paint biographical portraits of uh, area notables, and you certainly qualify in that area. Uh, but as we are doing biographical portraits, let's talk a little bit about your childhood. Where are you from? Where were you born? I was born in New York City in a project named Queensbridge. Queensbridge, New York Queensbridge, City. Queensbridge, right on the East River. Okay. Had about 3,800 family units, about 13,000 people living in that large, one of the largest projects in the country. What was really? that like for you in high school and, and so forth? Did you have any interest in, in the arts? Not in the arts, really. It wasn't until my senior year... Um, I had wandered, but I was injured. I was running a little bit of track, and you I fan, wandered yeah, by. You ran track, huh? It wasn't a really fast run. I just enjoyed track, but I mean, but I was wandering by um, the art studio, one of the arts, and I saw this guy, as Mr. Howard Yock. It was an art teacher at Long Island City High School, and I looked in, and he was chipping away at marble, and I kind of looked at him, and he said, "Would you like to try?" And I said, well, just kind of shook my head for a second, and then he said, "Well, we start with clay." Which he said, Would you, do you think you could do this? And this was sculpting. This, this was sculpting. Right. I said, of course, my little brash behind said, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> little hood. You know? Okay, so you, this was in high school, and you went away to college to uh, Springfield College. Yes, I Springfield, did. Springfield, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when I got up there, um, I was first a phys ed major. And um, I happened to be, I was in a work-study program. They, I happened to be working over in the art department. So I saw some people doing artwork, and I said, oh, I can do that. And the art pro professor, who was the chairman of the art department, um, Bill Blizzard, he looked over and he said, oh, you can do that? And so I grabbed some clay, and I started playing with it. And I remember I, the first thing I did was I sat and did a sculpture of one of the art students, her face. And he said, you really could. And so after that, he talked me into joining the art department because it was a new art department. It was called Art and Urban Life. And, uh, you know... Art, art and Urban Life. Art and Urban okay. Life, yeah. It was... Springfield had an interesting history. When I got up there today, I just finished a black student takeover of the administration building to get more black students. And, of course, it was during the... This is 1969, the fall of 1969. We were right in the middle of the um, civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. of course... Um, they had a very active African-American student organization. And there were some really some progressive um, you know, people up there that were really doing some things. And so I ended up going to that school. And, and as, a, as a result, I began to do, they started asking me, well, since you're an artist, you should be able to paint. Well, of course, I wasn't a painter. I was a sculptor. So of course, now they had approached the administration and said, look, we want, an, we, we want a black cultural center. Of course, now this big black culture, the House of Montu comes up, and the next thing they're saying is, we want a mural on the outside. So I go to Bill Blizzard, and I said, Bill, I don't have any paint. I said, how am I going to paint it? Number one. Number two, I'm not a painter. He said, oh, don't worry about it. You can do it. And of course, it was this fall of 1971. I started coming up with designs, and, and we started working on it, and I painted it, and I finished it in the early spring of 1972, and that began the murals. And this was a mural that you entitled for? I titled, a, yeah, I titled it after the, um, the book by Claude Brown, Man, Child, and the Promised Land, and really it was a summation. I had like all these, it was probably the, it was, it was really a crude looking thing that I did, because you know, remember, I was only 19, 20 years old when I started painting these things, and um, I mean, but that was the way it was during that movement time. I mean, most of us were all young. I mean, and so, you know, I did the painting, I did the designs, and I said, and 
it became the wall and then from there we painted the inside because the students wanted a nice place where they could meet and have poetry readings and if they wanted to have dances or get togethers or recitals they wanted inside so the next thing they asked me was paint the inside <laughs> well this is 60 feet so here I am and we've only got like four or five days and of course the first paint we used was latex wall paint not <laughs> Fine arts paint, but latex wall paint. That must have been interesting. Yeah, because it dripped all over the place. Right, you, right, you know, right. when you hit it on the wall, so right. it right, went right, down. Right. But we got it done, and it was really, you know, and I guess it was the times and the energy, and we had to, and during those days, we wanted to make an expression. And so that began the mural movement for me and the community arts, and from there on in, I started doing more murals and when I went to graduate school and I ran into a professor, Nelson Stevens, and of course Leonel Gongra and the murals, we did some more on the Nelson Stevens and um, No, you, you mentioned going. graduate school. This was at the uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Yeah, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Okay. Uh, and that was a, that was actually my, the art professor that was the chairman of the Springfield College Art Department, he said, I was getting ready to leave college in terms of, you know, four years, I'm finished, I'm in debt now, it's time for me to leave. Right. And he says, no, 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 it's not time, you need to go out and get some more education. Let me see how I can do this. And I don't know what he did, but he worked out and he told me to apply for University of Massachusetts, right. and he somehow worked out a deal. Bill Blizzard was a deal maker. <laughs> and I mean, and he told me, he said, go up there and you need to meet with these people and you're gonna, we're gonna figure out how to get you into graduate school. And the next thing I knew, I was accepted in to UMass Amherst, and I was first in the foundry, actually, because they knew more about my sculpture. And so I was casting bronze work early in my. Let me, let me uh, shift gears on you a little bit here, because I, I want to talk about something else that was a, a, an eventful time, in, an eventful moment in your life that also dealt with the art. Uh, and it, it afforded you introduction to a beautiful woman by the name of Gail Davis. How yeah. did that come into being? She your was a, wife. Yeah, she was a graduate student, and um, this is really funny, but actually she was putting, I didn't know her really. She, she was putting together a show, an art show, and somebody had told her that I was a painter and I had some paintings. Well, during that time, I was going through some really rough times with my, the chairman of the art department because he was, he was really preparing me as a graduate student. really get out there and, and do some really good work. So he had told me, well, look, you know, you need to think about leaving and find another way to do what you're doing. And George Wardlaw was one of these guys that he had exhibited in the New York museums and, stu and galleries, the, the top ones. Mm -hmm. And so when he, and, but he would come, he was on sabbatical during that time, and he would come to my studio at the New Africa House and sit down with me and talk to me. Then I had another person, Nelson Stevens, who was talking to me at that same time. So, you know, it was kind of, I was looking for, searching for something, and of course, here came Gail, who was asking me for paintings, and I was like, I don't have time for this. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta finish up an MFA show in about a year, please. And so she never got him. And, and of but course- But she got you. Well, yeah, I guess she got stuck with me. But. You know, and, and you guys uh, have been writing partners, and I, I want to talk about that uh, uh, because in, in a moment we're going to take a look at a, uh, a project, uh, Welcome Home, uh, Daddy Seal, and I'm going to have you set that up. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, let's talk a little bit about your writing before we get to that point. Uh, uh, you transitioned from doing mur murals uh, to writing. Yeah. Because you mentioned, you mentioned Sonia Sanchez earlier when we were talking. Yeah, Sonia, I'm, actually, Sonia was my first um, writing teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, I met her at the County Color Library, and she taught me how to do poetry. And, you know, and that's basically, and then I saw her again at UMass, and we did some really great things during that time. 
And you and Gail have uh, written plays together. What, what have you done? What have you written? We've uh, written several um, screenplays, stage plays, several musicals. A couple of them have been produced in Equity in Philadelphia. Um, done in, uh, a bunch of them in um, Spring, in, um, not in, in, um, in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh -huh. So it's really... Um, well, yeah. we're going we're gonna to talk some more about these plays. But right now, let's take a look at uh, Welcome Home, Daddy Seal. Uh, can you set it up for us very quickly? Yeah. Welcome Home is, um, let's, let's say this, it's a Navy SEAL coming home. He's been a, a, he's been a hero over in Afghanistan, Iraq. He finds out he has a nine-year-old daughter that he didn't even know he had. And um, she's an incorrigible little kid. And, but she has nowhere to go because her mother is in jail. And that's the, so he has to take, and will she change him or will he change her? All right, so let's take a look at that now. Now, who's responsible for this child today? I am, Your Honor. Her real father, while living the good life in his beachfront home, while this poor, misguided child has been raising herself in the streets. Okay, okay, okay. Be, be seated, be seated. Look, word of advice, plead guilty, and get her out of here before she takes the judge off again. The child needs a stable home, which the mother cannot do since she's incarcerated. She's a political prisoner. Of what, a bad choice of boyfriend? <laughs> you sure that this Navy SEAL, Master Chief, is the father? His name is on the birth certificate, and he's an expert in anti-terrorist tactics. A whole lot of years have passed by. Her mother never told me. It's not the sort of thing you keep quiet. Ms. McDuffie, do we have any civil unions? Any common law agreements, applications for marriage? We have the Norfolk court records to prove that he was married to the mother at the time of conception. And where's the mother now? <clears throat> Still in jail for cashing bad checks with the fake father, Pookie Johnson. Don't I get to say something? Only if it's in proper English. My daddy is the man I live with all my life. Well, that was the first mistake. So where were you when this child was born? Deployed, Your Honor. And stayed missing in action for eight years? Her mother didn't tell me. And your point is what? I guess I upset Taquanda when I re-enlisted before I told her. She never liked being left alone. Well, that was one night that she wasn't alone. <laughs> oh, man, that looks like a very interesting piece. I can't wait to see that. Yeah, it's going to be fun. We had, And actually, uh, one of the people from... Um, Dream City University, uh, Cadence. Majesty brought her, we, you know, we found her through Sylvia Hudson and um, great little talent. I mean, she's in her, own little, in her own little world and probably gonna be a great actress. Fantastic. So you and Gail wrote this piece as yeah, well? Yeah, Gail, myself, um, a brother from, um, what do you call, um, Marcus, Ely from California, and Hunter Thomas helped us with the uh, first okay. script. Okay, yeah, I know Hunter. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, again, your uh, writing collaboration with Gail goes back to the Negro Ensemble Company. That sounds exciting. Tell us about that. Well, about 1977, we were starting to, uh, Gail and I were writing, we, were, we wanted to write stories. And so, in 1978, we were looking for places, and we found... Um, you know, a couple of places that we could go to in New York City. And at the time, I was working in New Jersey, and she was working in New Jersey, too. So we said, um, let's go over to New York. And we went to actually several different places. We went to the Negro Ensemble Company, and we went to um, the New Federal, and we also went to the Frederick Douglass Creative Arts Center. But what was interesting about the Negro Ensemble was um, Steve Carter. Yes, and then and when you and I, we brought Steve Carter in town yes, back in the days of Ron Keel, some again, almost 30 years ago. Yeah, he's 85 years old now. <laughs> Incredible. You know, and, and just a great man. I mean, Indeed. I remember just working with him was like, he was very nurturing, but he knew theater. He was like yeah, our Tennessee yes. Williams. Yes. And yeah. this man, I mean, if you didn't know who he was, he wouldn't say anything. People would walk and they were looking for the playwright, and they were like, well, if you'd see him, tell me um, which one is Steve Carter, and he'd say, I'll... I'll tell him when he gets here, <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden he steps up and here's this off-Broadway playwright who's been an Obie Award winner, who's standing up there and he's saying, welcome, and, you know, we'll study some plays and we'll 
find, figure out. And he would just. And this was, is at the NEC. Yes, and the, the NEC Ensemble was great. Uh -huh. I mean, what was great about it was because they de they nurtured you as a playwright, and then they developed your work, you know, through a series of readings. And during those days when they would have people like Francis Foster, Gloria Foster, Adolph Caesar. I remember yeah. we had Adolph Caesar reading in our play, Reg Novell Johnson, I mean, you know, Laurie Hayes. I mean, all these folk that had acted in the Negro Ensemble would come back and give back. So you had all of those people reading your work. Oh, we had Sam Mudd Williams, Reg Novell right. Johnson, Adolph Caesar. And these were the people in the in people like, you know, Ramona King and Charlie yes. Fuller and all them. Yes. They were all in the workshops. These were people that were coming in and out and you know, Steve was working with them and Doug Turner, you Doug know, was Turner Ward was uh -huh. working with them, the founder. I mean, uh -huh. they were just great people. It was a time in New York and this was where you had to go. It was either Woody King, if you were African American. And Woody King was at the New Federal. Yeah, if you were African American, uh -huh. you either went to Woody King, uh -huh. you went to you know, Fred Hudson or you went to um, Douglas Turner Ward and Steve Carter, because that's where you could hone your craft. All of these uh, plays that we're talking about, let's, let's talk about a couple of them. Let's talk about um, perhaps a couple of your favorites and, and just give us some storylines and, and, and how they came into being, the plays. You're talking about my plays? Yes, yeah, yes. Well, I think the, the, the one that really started us was, um, Gail and I, was um, Phantom of the Phantom, 87. Yeah. It wasn't our first play. Actually, our first play was Night of the Wizard, which later became a piece that we're working on called Angels in Hip Hop Land. <laughs> okay. Okay, but, um, and we did a piece called The Way with uh, the Youth Entertainment Studio, which we really had a lot of fun doing. And uh -huh. they did it over in Chesapeake with the kids and some young and some adult actors. And everybody came from the community. And what was beautiful about it was it was about our story. And one of the things we, Gail and I, have always wanted to do was always write for our children, write for our, you know, write for African-American actresses and actors. So they feel that this role was written for them, mm -hmm. nobody else. And so Phantom, back to Phantom. Phantom right. was an interesting one because Phantom started, I used to coach kids track. And I was down in Asbury Park, and, um, and actually I was in Lakewood, not Asbury Park. But this kid, he jumped on the bus, little 11-year-old, he jumped on the bus. He wasn't a part of their team. But he jumped on the bus, and we were down in Lakewood, New Jersey, in this really ritzy track. I mean, people, I mean, this was a really posh place, and uh, folk were really well-dressed. And this kid, what he was doing was he was jumping in behind the runners just to see if he could stay behind them and see how far he would he could prove to himself mm -hmm. that he, he could run. So I went up to him and I was talking to him for a little while and I said, well, have you ever run a race? He said, no. He said, I never finished one because he couldn't afford it. So I bought him two entry fees, one for the 800 meters and one for the mile. We pinned the, got him, pinned his little, th pinned his little um, numbers on the, his back and, um, you know, we, um, my team and I get one of the guys, T, he had a couple extra shirts, so he gave him one. I didn't even know he had those shirts, but he gave him one of the shirts anyway. And so the kid were lined up on the line with all these other 11-year-olds, and they, most of them were all taller than him. And it was probably about 25 of them when they, when they started in the half mile. And the gun went off, and he falls over and trips over one of them. And I'm looking at him, and my whole team is looking at him, and he's 40, 50 yards behind by the time he gets up. Well, you know, I'm saying to myself, wow. This kid is over for him. Right. I mean, and all of a sudden I see one of my runners, one of the kids that when I first started with him, he almost, he got thrown off his junior high school team, so he came to the park, and now he was one of the finalists for the Hershey National 100-yard dash, and when he flew out, and he's running around the circle, man, get up, come on, you can get up, you can win it, you can get up. He runs, I had never seen T run any further than a 220-yard dash at 13 years old. That's what he competed in the 100 and the 200. Well, T has gone past the 220. He's still yelling to this kid. The infield, and right now all the judges are looking at him like, what in the world is going on? Right. He's 330, 440. He's passing the 440 to 550. In the meanwhile, my other runners, Rico and JoJo Baltimore and Carl, they're all running with him, talking about, 
you can still connect. And I'm watching this kid, this little 11 year old kid, cut the distance down. And I see him on the backstretch. And he's coming down the backstretch. And I'm saying to myself, this kid who has some cut down shorts and didn't even have track sneakers when he went there, mm. is gonna possibly catch some of these runners. And I'm watching him all the way. And meanwhile, my team is going, this, it's a static there. Yeah, they're going crazy. Right, right. And he's coming down that finish line. And it's neck and neck with two or three of the runners. And he surges ahead of him at the finish line and wins. So how, how does this work into the, the story? It begins, what happened is he runs the mile and he does the same thing. But this time he wins by 100. He doesn't fall. He wins by over 100 yards. And I he sat down with him. He says to me, you know, you can take my medals. And I said, no, they're yours. You won them. But I'm sitting down with a piece of paper in my hand and I started writing. I said, this is what it's about. Kids. And I said, and I started writing about the story. Can you want to win really bad? Better than anybody else can. Can you want to win over one and, and tell the winners, hey, what a winner. Can you make a penny into a dime and make a miracle out of an ordinary line and go beyond, beyond, be remembered for all time and be and be the first to be at the finish line. If you had to run in real old shoes, could you want to run faster than anybody else do? If you had to cut down real old shorts, could you want to finish first more, of course? Can you make a nickel into a dollar, buy silver moonbeams for half price and give them to the fowlers in spite of rocks and glass all over your track? You cross the finish line and first, at last, spread a little winning on the right track. Nothing more than confidence, of course. And, I, and, and it began... Now this was a this song? Was the, this was the rap that went into the, the play. Okay. But it began... What would happen if a creature who was a ghost came to the playground where kids gave up and taught them how to win? Kids like our kids. Yes. yes. Who basically, they were just, you know, kids that just grew up on their own. Yes. And so the phantom was that individual. It was that spirit that came to the playground. And he only, he disappeared at the moment of try. And after that, because I had been with the New Jersey Arts Council and I had learned and I, now the job was over and I had been gone for a couple of years, I got back with some of the guys and we were writing music and of course, we started putting together some of the tunes and I started humming them because I had played a horn and when I was in, a kid and um, my mother was a piano player. So she would help me to figure out some of the tunes that were in my head. And I'd start, you know, okay, this one goes this way and this one goes this way. And, and so we, um, Gail and I would sit there and we were crafting this, this piece out. And it was wow. really amazing because what was happening was we were, we were starting to look at a character, a spirit of an old dead slave coming through the Middle Passage, drowning, but God gave a second choice, chance to. And he told him, in every playground where there is turmoil, you, if one kid has a, a wish, you appear and you only stay there until you teach that group of kids the moment of try. And you cannot stop until Fantastic the, story. The whole, Fantastic story. Every playground in the world is pure peace. And you've done quite a bit, Clyde. You've been a, mural, a muralist, uh, a sculptor, which I didn't know, uh, a screenwriter, a playwright. You just have a whole lot going on. I want to thank you so very much for taking time out of that busy schedule of yours. I know you're retired, but you're the busiest retired person I've ever seen. Yeah. And thank you guys for joining us for this, the fifth edition of Biorhythms. Stay tuned. Tell all of your friends we're going to be doing a whole lot more. My name is Terrence Affer Anderson, and this has been Biorhythms. <laughs>